Welcome to the third season and 100th episode of Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. The Appalachian Mountain spanned 2,000 miles from Newfoundland in Canada and runs south all the way down to Alabama in the U.S. Loretta Smith and her husband divorced when their only child was six months old. She raised Randall alone in Parisburg, Virginia, a small town of a couple thousand people buried at the base of the Appalachian Mountains. There, the two resided in a small, rundown house with only four rooms and a basement. Loretta worked in the laundry room of the local hospital, just enough to keep a roof over their heads and food on the table. She kept to herself. It was just her and Randall. Growing up, Randall was a loner who enjoyed fishing and hunting. He didn't belong to any community groups, was never a Boy Scout, and didn't play sports. In high school, he didn't have a girlfriend, nor any friends for that matter. Occasionally, when he would leave the safety of his comfort zone and try to fit in, he embellished his life to try and get others to accept him. South Coast Today reported, that he told people he owned property in other states, and he talked about girlfriends and claimed to be a father. But nobody believed him. His habitual lying eventually earned him the nickname LR, short for Lying Randall. Looking out his bedroom window, he could almost touch the mountains. Their gentle breeze called out to him, and he spent his free time hiking the Appalachians in solitude. There he felt he belonged. He was at peace. Randall grew to be 5 foot 8 inches and 165 pounds. His dark hair was short and parted on the side. He had thick eyebrows perched above his dark eyes. Randall left high school after grade 11 and went to work briefly in the shipyards. In May 1981, two friends from Maine who were social workers made plans to hike the Appalachian Trail to raise money for charity. Robert Mountford Jr. and Laura Susan Ramsey were experienced hikers and excited about their trip. Along the way, they befriended a fellow female hiker and made plans to meet up with her in the area above Harrisburg. Robert and Laura stopped at the local grocery store where they ran into 27-year-old Randall. That evening, the couple approached the Wapiti shelter to make camp for the night. The shelter sat in the shade under a canopy of tall trees, a three-sided log cabin with a shake roof and wooden floor. A welcome sight. They built a fire and used a piece of wrought iron that was laying nearby to poke the logs and fan the flames to warm their bodies. Randall stopped by and visited for a while with Laura. Then Robert and Laura enjoyed dinner and a shot of rum before retiring for the night. It's not known exactly what happened. But what we do know is that sometime during that dark night, Randall returned uninvited. His steps were silent. He took his twenty-two pistol and fired a shot 
into Robert's head. Then he fired another shot and another. Laura heard the shots, jumped up, and started to run. Randall ran after her when he spotted the wrought iron and grabbed it. Out of the corner of his eye, he spotted a long spike nail and stabbed her. Laura fell to the ground and raised her hands up to defend herself. Randall used the opportunity to wound his prey. With the wrought iron, he struck her on the head. The couple who began their hike to raise money for the less fortunate were hunted, shot, and stabbed. Robert and Laura died on the Appalachian Mountain Trail at 27. He dragged their bodies from the shelter and dug their graves by hand. He placed Laura into a sleeping bag. He dragged Robert further from the shelter and buried him in another sleeping bag. Randall tore through their belongings. Finding Laura's camera, he opened it and ripped the film out. He rifled through her backpack and thumbed through a paper bag he found. He took some of their things and used his compass to bury them at precise points under rocks and in tree stumps so that he could retrieve them later. He took a few of their possessions with him and scrambled down the mountain. When he passed a shelter with a log book, he snatched it, leaving no trace of their names or dates. Reaching home, he stumbled into the basement. He knew he couldn't stay. It was no longer his refuge. He climbed behind the wheel of his truck and didn't look back. Meanwhile, the female hiker waited for Robert and Laura in the mountains above Parisburg. When they didn't arrive, she was worried and alerted authorities. Deputy Sheriff Tom Lawson grabbed a couple investigators and went to the trail. A hiker said they had seen the couple near the Wapiti shelter and that they were there with a strange-looking man. Another hiker came forward to say that she was with the couple when Laura purchased the paperback. Investigators then went to the local country store and discovered the couple had been there May 19th. Several people told them about a man who walked around saying, he knew what happened to the hikers. The sheriff asked if they knew the man's name, and someone replied, Lying Randall. Investigators went back to the Appalachian Trail, and other hikers recalled seeing Randall at the shelter with Laura. And two hikers recalled seeing Robert and Laura, and a third person was with them. A man? They gave off an eerie vibe. On May 30th, it had been 11 days since Robert and Laura were last seen. Investigators hiked to the Wapiti shelter. Sheriff Lawson ran his eyes around its walls, then his eyes dropped down to the floor. He told NBC News that it was dark, like something had been rubbed on it. He looked down between the floorboards and spotted a red substance. He and the investigators tore the floorboards up and discovered blood. They fanned out nearly a hundred feet in all directions. In an open area, they came upon a mound of leaves that looked out of place, like someone had raked them into a pile. One of these searchers noticed something peeking through the leaves. Underneath, they discovered a sleeping bag. Inside was a body of Laura. Investigators searched for Robert, but then night fell. 
The next day, a cadaver dog was brought in. Several hundred yards from the shelter, the dog picked up a scent, stopped at a stump, and sat down. The investigators began digging and found Robert. They recovered the spike nail and the piece of wrought iron, but the gun was gone. They found some of their possessions hidden under rocks and in stumps, and they located Laura's paperback with a bloody fingerprint ingrained within its pages. Sheriff Lawson thought back to the name Lying Randall and closed off the Appalachian Trail above Harrisburg and put out a nationwide all-points bulletin on Randall. Investigators visited Loretta and searched the home she shared with her son. In the basement, they found items that belonged to Robert and Laura and a pair of jeans soaked in blood. They also found a note written by Randall claiming that two people had kidnapped him and he was going to be killed. Investigators didn't believe a word of it. Days passed with no sign of Randall. Then on June 8th, 300 miles away, law enforcement found Randall's truck abandoned in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Stuffed inside the truck's ashtray was a note, which in part read, This boy and girl have been so nice to me. It's going to be a real shame when the time comes to get rid of them. Officers combed the area and spotted a makeshift camp. Inside was Randall. He didn't resist arrest, but pretended he had amnesia. Officers contacted the sheriff's office back in Virginia, and by a complete fluke, Sheriff Lawson was vacationing in Myrtle Beach. A squad car raced with lights flashing to the motel to pick him up. At the station, he took one look and recognized him. Randall appeared worn out and was scratching insect bites that covered his body. Investigators came up with a plan. They told him the bites looked serious and he required medical attention. But to do that, he'd have to sign a consent form. They slid it across to him. He eagerly grabbed it and wrote his name, Randall Lee Smith. Randall was returned to Virginia and charged with two counts of murder. He refused to talk. Forensic analysis confirmed that it was Robert's blood on the floorboards at the shelter, and fingerprint records from when Randall worked at the shipyard identified the bloody fingerprint in Laura's paperback as his, and they had the hiker who had witnessed her buying it. Investigators also had the spike nail and wrought iron used to kill Laura. But the prosecution felt the trial would be difficult without a motive and the gun. Ten months after their murders, in March 1982, the night before the trial was to begin, Randall's lawyers offered up a plea bargain. Randall would plead guilty to two counts of second-degree murder in exchange for a 30-year sentence. Randall was considered a model prisoner and came up for parole after five years. The parole board was flooded with phone calls and letters from Robert and Laura's family and friends. Randall was denied parole. While incarcerated, he had no visitors, except for his mother once, although they spoke on the phone. After serving 15 years, Randall reached his mandatory parole date. He was released in September 1996. Two of the conditions were that he wear an ankle monitor and be on probation for 10 years. The Roanoke Times reported 
the 43-year-old Randall walked back through the front door of his mother's home and returned to his solitary life, back to fishing and hiking the Appalachian Mountains. In 2000, Randall's mother died, and he was alone in the world. His only company, his faithful dog, Bo. In 2006, it was 10 years since his release, and his probation ended. In the spring of 2008, Randall had exhausted the small amount of money his mother had left him. The neighbors noticed the mail was piling up. Then on August 28, his water was cut off. Two days later, he was reported missing. Police investigated and hung missing posters around town, but no one had seen Randall. 54-year-old Randall took his dog Bo and hiked into the Appalachian Mountains. But what little food he brought with him didn't last long. Over the weeks, he and Bo lost weight. On the morning of May 6, he tried to catch a fish, but wasn't having any luck. Scott Johnson had just set up camp in the Appalachians and was waiting for his friend, Sean Farmer, to arrive. He had just gone fishing and caught six trout. On the way back to his camp, he spotted a dog with his ribs showing. It was Bo. Then he spotted Randall, standing thin, wearing a camouflage jacket. The man got to talking about fishing, and Scott showed him his catch. Randall's hungry eyes lit up. Scott could see that he and his dog hadn't eaten in a while, so he gave Randall a few fish. The Washington Post detailed how Randall asked Scott if he was camping nearby, and he replied by pointing the direction of his campsite. Randall said he was camped just past there and might stop by later. Back at camp, Scott was gathering firewood when Sean arrived. He pitched his tent and had just finished when Randall and Bo strolled in. Soon the three men were shooting the breeze, and next thing they knew, it was dinner time. The men invited Randall and Bo to join them. They heated up beans and fried up the trout, throwing an extra piece on the grill for Bo. The hours passed and it was getting dark, and the men wondered when their guest would leave. Then Randall stood up and told his dog, Come on, boy. Randall casually walked behind Sean, pulled out his twenty-two, and fired, just like he'd done twenty-seven years earlier. The bullet slammed into Sean's temple. Randall spun around and fired a second shot, hitting Scott in the neck. Then a third bullet rained fire out of the gun barrel and hit Sean in the chest. He was a big man at six foot four and 325 pounds. The bullets had hit him hard, but he was still alive. Bo howled into the night. <coughs> Scott ran for the trees, trying to hide. Randall turned and fired the gun towards him, hitting him in the back at the base of his neck. Scott ducked and hid. In those brief few seconds, Sean seized the opportunity and ran towards his truck. Randall raced after him. Sean got there first and ducked into the passenger side. Randall reached the driver's side, raised his arm, and pulled the trigger. But the gun didn't fire. It was out of bullets. As Randall reloaded the gun... Sean turned the key and stomped on the gas pedal. Scott saw his friend escape in the truck and headed through the bush a short distance before coming out on the road. He saw headlights. Sean flung the door open and Scott jumped in. The two men, reeling from the gunshots, 
were running on adrenaline. With no cell phone reception, they raced down the narrow mountain road in the dark, barely missing the cliffs with 20-foot drop-offs. They knew they couldn't make it to the nearest hospital 30 miles away, that at any minute Randall could show up behind them in Scott's truck. With their hearts racing and blood splurting from their wounds, it took both of them to keep the truck on the road. They spotted the silhouette of a house, but as they neared, they could see it was under construction. They kept driving. The second house was dark. Then, finally, they spotted a third house with its lights on. They screeched to a stop, and Sean ran to the front door and banged on it. Melissa Miller was home with her 20-year-old son Randy and his grandfather. They called for an ambulance and wrapped the injured men in towels, but within minutes, they were drenched in blood. The ambulance arrived along with police. Sean couldn't talk, but Scott was able to give them a description. Randy's grandfather knew about Randall and told his grandson to drive down to the grocery store and grab the missing person flyer. Randy raced to the store. It was closed, but he knew where the owner lived. With a poster in hand, he sped back to the house. As Scott was being loaded into the ambulance, he was shown the poster and positively identified Randall. Soon, a state trooper spotted Randall driving Scott's truck and gave chase. Randall sped off, but lost control, drove off the road, and flipped the truck. When the officer arrived, Randall was still inside, resting within arm's reach, was a 22. Lieutenant Ron Hamlin peered in and saw the coldest eyes he'd ever seen. Randall was taken to the hospital, the same hospital where Scott and Sean were. The two men required multiple surgeries and would later have a lengthy recovery. Randall was released from the hospital two days later and taken to jail. A day later, he was found unresponsive in his cell, dead at 54, from complications of the car crash. Randall was buried next to his mother. His graveside funeral was attended by a few family members and his dog, Bo, who laid beside the grave and scratched at the dirt. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Anthony Garcia. He had dreams of being a doctor, but his peers found him to be rude, belligerent, arrogant, lazy, combative, and mean-spirited. He was fired many times. For seven years, he quietly struggled. Then he sought revenge. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music, sound effects from Vestlian Studios, and Quick Sounds, and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com and on all major podcast platforms. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. And feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them. We're not shy. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.